this guy, let's get right into this because I know we wanted to cut this one up a little bit. We referenced it a lot in the last episode. A lot of mentions about 10 year yield. Mm. What is that? <coughs> Excuse me, man. I'm so sorry. Yeah, man. You're. you're How so does it correlate with other stuff? <laughs> okay. Over there. <coughs> God damn it. Did the question have cops in it too? Or it is did. That it own, did. That was your own addition. That's what it was. Yeah. So I've got a structured way that I wanted to answer this because so many people had asked different questions that relate to it that I thought that there was um, a little bit of benefit in um, in kind of explaining this in a more methodical pa uh, path. So I, I wrote it down a little bit here. Okay. Um, so let's think about – so the question was really about the 10-year, but there's a 10-year and then there is also the bond market. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Mortgage rates, believe it or not, are not actually influenced or based on by the 10-year treasury. Uh, it's commonly believed that, that there's a connection there. But really, fixed mortgage rates and treasury yields typically just move together, right? Um, so the 10-year is typically looked at as, as a solid indicator for mortgage backs uh, in mortgage, the mortgage market in general. But the reason why this is important is the underlying bond market and what that really means. And there's a number of questions in the Q&A about bonds. So uh, the, the easiest way to answer, I think, the bond market is, is that the bond market is very similar but yet very different uh, to <laughs> – Arun pulled up chat GPT, <laughs> the answer here. Uh, they're very different uh, in some ways, but they typically are competing markets. Uh, the stock market has risks that the bond market doesn't have. Uh, generally speaking, the bond market is considered safer and the stock market is considered riskier, for example. But they're usually competing marketplaces. You don't necessarily go into one – unless there's stress in one or the other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So fixed income markets influence both the stock market, since the bond markets compete for investment dollars with the stock market and the overall economy. So it's important to understand the bond market, even if you have no intention of ever owning bonds, because the influence works both ways. So uh, unlike the stock market, where you trade stock on a global exchange, you typically don't buy bonds that way. You usually buy the bonds directly, whoever issues the bonds which are really just debt instruments you're buying debt mm -hmm. you're buying somebody you're giving people somebody money for a debt holder place think of it as like a government loan not always governments though yeah you, but you can have there's tons of different things but it's basically a primary market and then there's a secondary market so the primary market is basically the new issue of bonds bonds that have just been issued by a corporation by a municipality by a government agency whoever may issue them right right and the secondary market is like usually a broker or somebody trading them after they've been newly issued, mm -hmm. right? But there isn't like a New York Stock Exchange for the bond market, for example. Right. So it's not quite the same ease of access that most people would get to. And I think that intimidates a lot of people. So uh, some quick highlights, and I wrote, again, wrote, wrote some of this stuff down to be somewhat thoughtful and, and consistent. Government bonds are probably the ones that most people think about, the U.S. Treasuries. Again, the 10-year is a great U.S. Treasury. Because right? it's, all, it's viewed as a safe, the safest investment. Typically viewed as the safest investment because the U.S. is so strong. They're considered the, quote, safest bonds in the world since they are backed by the U.S. government. In fact, treasuries are considered so secure that their yields are used to determine the risk-free rate, mm -hmm. right? What are, you, what are you getting paid on a risk-free asset? Because this treasury, backed by the United States, has almost no risk in it. Make sense? Right. There's also municipal bonds, municipalities. Think um, uh, government agencies, government infrastructure, stuff like that, uh, cities. They'll typically use these to issue debt to then use your money and build things, buildings, infrastructure, stuff like that. Uh, they're typically considered very, very safe, not as safe as government bonds. The last one that uh, really had a significant presence, I think uh, Puerto Rico in 2017, if I recall correctly, they had a pretty big default on their municipal bonds. It was around 70, 75 billion, if I recall correctly. Next is the mortgage backed market. And this is really the tie because mortgage backed securities are, are really mortgage bonds mm -hmm. so the fallout in the great recession the mortgage-backed security market was actually the mortgage bond market falling out these are considered uh a little bit different risk profile but basically to explain this and again i wrote this down the financial crisis notwithstanding the mortgage bonds have historically been the safe a very safe investment they can be an opportunity for bond investors looking for high yield income interest rates for 30-year fixed mortgages hover around seven percent in late 2022 and they've now gone up to about 8% in this market so far today. So there's, there's been an increase in what those will pay you. Yeah, the highest in 16 or 17 years. All right. So without any further ado, the bottom line is there's very difference, very different. But a bond is a debt instrument. 
they're considered safer. Now, what do we know about safe investments? Safe investments pay you less typically than a riskier investment, right? Mm -hmm. Shorter investments typically pay you less than a longer investment. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into a longer bond, it should pay you more than a shorter term bond, but that's not what's happening right now. That's the yield curve inversion. Right. The 10 year is paying you less than the two year treasuries, all safe, risk free investments. So it, it's a very different kind of perspective than I think the most people who get into the stock market. And I think it can, can be confusing for some, but that is what it is. So the tre 10 year treasury bonds, and then I, I promise I'll wrap this up. I know it's a long answer, but a lot of people ask about this. The importance of the 10 year treasury bond on yield goes beyond just understanding the return on the investment. Okay, the return on the investment is only one way of looking at it. You really have to look at the underlying safety. It's kind of a proxy for how safe the underlying markets are, which is why the 10-year movements that we've been talking about to the degree that they've been moving recently up are so concerning. It's scary because all the treasuries are rising and the inversion is still happening. So at some point, either the floor drops out on the low end of the curve, the two-year, three-month, three and the three-year treasuries drop down and the 10-year stays where it's at, or the 10-year spikes up. If the 10-year spikes up, that puts tremendous upside pressure on mortgage rates. And when that happens, mortgage rates will go up. Not because they're linked, but because of long-term implications. So this can effectively push the price up of U.S. government bonds as demand increases, thus lowering yields. More people willing to buy, yields go down. Right, and the yield is just the return on your investment, right? Right, so more people competing for these really ultra-safe investments means they can pay you less because they can go to somebody else who will take the investment. Right. Think about it as supply and demand, right? When, yeah, when yields go up, the values of the bonds go down. Yeah, exactly. So another factor related to the yield is the timing to maturity. Longer treasury bonds, again, like I know, to typically pay more. So we'll wrap this up with um, the, the tie together. So this one's a little bit harder to explain, but uh, so... The treasury note often serves as kind of a signal about the market's expectation for future growth. Yes. Which is why you're seeing some really strange things in the market right now. We've talked so much about it. So the fact that it has recently increased is reflective of economic growth, but also parallels the fact that inflation is also at an all-time recent high now. Yes. Okay. So because the treasury notes are so commonly traded, their interest rate also serves as a signal about the market's expectations for future growth. Exactly. And what, what that means to me um, is, okay, when, when I, the way I look at these, these bonds and treasury markets, right, I literally look at it as an expectation of what the market or people think is to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if the two-year and the three-year, basically a loan for a company or the government two years from now, right, is significantly higher than what it would be if I gave them a 10-year loan, right? Then there's a lot of uncertainty what can happen in the near future, right? When it should be the other way around, as you alluded to earlier, right? Right. So what I had here to, to cap the thought is, is when markets expect the economy to grow, forecasts for treasury notes will reflect that in higher interest rate, right? So, in fact, one harbinger of a recession is, again, the inverted yield curve. When the return on a three-month or two-year treasury bill is higher than that of the 10-year rate, well, this doesn't always lead to a recession. It certainly signals, signals pessimism from the financial markets. And again, we've been in an inverted yield curve for the longest period since 1981. Yep. So because of that, that is inherently, by definition, pessimism in the markets and typically, again, signals a recession, and yet we've been in one for the longest period of time that that in modern history. Right. And the... Uh, the other way I look at the 10-year uh, treasury being tied to mortgage rates, even though it's not, right, is if, as you mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, um, a, a loan to the government, if it's a government bond, is considered the safest investment. Right. Right? If that's considered a safe investment, then a loan to an individual, by pure happenstance, would have to be a little bit riskier. So if the 10-year is at 4.4%, right, mm -hmm. and that continues to creep up, that means the risk to a loan to the government is slowly creeping up. Therefore, a risk to you, the individual, buying a home would have to slowly creep up. So to, to now kind of put this as simple as possible, because we know the basics, we know that mortgage-backed securities are a type of bond. 
right? We know that treasury yields are the safest type of bond. Treasury yields in mortgage-backed securities, again, outside of the last of the Great Recession, which have been very safe, they typically compete for the same investors, right? One is slightly safer than the other historically, at least until the Great Recession, meaning that the corporate and municipal bonds, generally the treasuries, are safer than the mortgage-backed securities. So the fixed rate, the fixed mortgage rates and the treasury yields generally move together. Why? Because as a fixed rate asset, mortgage-backed securities are in direct competition with treasury instrument for investor money, right? If the treasury, because the pessimism in the market creeps up and treasuries begin to pay more, what happens? You can now charge more for your mortgage-backed security prices because they're trying to compete for one another. So as more pessimism creeps up, that 10-year creeps up, the 10-year pricing creeps up, and now mortgage-backed securities can pay higher yields mm -hmm. because they're competing for the same investors. So even though the numbers aren't directly aligned, you'll see this consistent push-up of both of these together as pessimism arrives and they compete for the same type of people looking for the same type of returns. Right. And that's what typically puts pressure on the mortgage because the mortgage-backed securities where all these mortgages are then sold off into the secondary market. So let's put this real simply. If you say you'd go get a home loan today at 7%, seven right? Seven and a half, yeah. Seven and a half, whatever. And that's sold into a mortgage-backed security. It's securitized in the secondary market. Basically, you sell that off into a trust. The trust then securitizes it or you securitize it directly. It's sold as a security on Wall Street as a bond. Yes. If that bond pays 8%, but the tenure treasuries are lower than that. You've got a really good return. People are going to go buy that. Yes. Right? If the treasuries are paying 8%, but your bond rate is only 7% right. on and yours. If the tenure treasury continues to increase. Right. As the tenure treasury continues to increase, I'm going to take the safer U.S. treasury bond that pays more than I'm going to take the mortgage-backed security. Mm -hmm. So these mortgage-backed securities have to compete with that, and they put upward pressure on mortgage rates because if I'm going to take your loans and sell them into this market, I've got to compete with where the treasuries are at. If the treasuries are a better return and they're safer, even though we're talking about shades of, of, of safe because they're all relatively safe investments, and that's what ultimately pushes it up. It's basically supply and demand playing out on a very, very broad like, spectrum, yeah. but it's competing with the safeness of a U.S.-backed treasury return, which is eking higher. You also just screwed over every reel we could have made for that whole thing because your hand was right in front of your face. I feel like that's the most attractive I've ever been. <laughs>